What if I told you there's a place in America where steam still runs the show? Massive trees are handled like living giants, and every creak and hiss feels like a page from a history book? Stick with me. You're about to meet a living, breathing sawmill that time forgot. We're standing on the edge of the old growth, where the air smells like wet earth and resin, and the trees seem to disappear into the clouds. Out here, species like Douglas fir and western red cedar aren't just trees, they're monuments. Some of these trunks are so wide and straight, they could have been hewn into the ribs of ships or the beams of century-old bridges. Felling these giants isn't a weekend afternoon project. This work asks for patience, rhythm, and more than a little humility. You can feel it in the way a cutter reads a tree, not just with their eyes, but with their whole body. They watch the lean, listen for the wind through the crown, and imagine where the weight will go the instant the chainsaw bites in. One misread, one unexpected gust, and everything changes. When the tree finally gives, the forest exhales. That's when the yarder takes over. An enormous cable-operated beast that moves logs like toys. Imagine a tall, stoic crane on a mountain slope, cables running like spider webs through the trees, guiding 40, 50, sometimes 80-foot trunks up steep pitches and over gullies. It's part engineering marvel, part choreography. Drivers, riggers, and hand crews working together so the log doesn't tear up the hillside on its way down. Next comes the marathon most people don't see. Those logs are loaded onto heavy haul trucks, Kenworths and Peterbilts with frames built like tanks. These rigs are legends for a reason. They chew up muddy grades, shove through switchbacks, and haul tens of thousands of pounds like it's nothing. The drivers? They're hawk-eyed and steady-handed, clinging to the wheel while their loads fight for uphill traction. There's no glamour here, just intense focus and a respect for the road. After miles of dirt and switchbacks, you crest a final ridge and the mill appears. A complex of weathered steel and timber, steam vents, and stacks of wood reaching skyward. It looks like a town built around a heart, the steam plant. That heartbeat is what keeps this place alive. Giant boilers hissing, pistons thumping, belts and gears that still run on steam power. It's not a museum prop. It's a working system humming with purpose. But before any log meets a blade, there's a ritual they all undergo, the soak. The log pond might look like a quiet pond at first glance, but it's really a sorting room, a live inventory, and a pressure valve all at once. Hundreds of logs float there, bobbing like an enormous lumbering puzzle. When you stand at the bank and watch, it's oddly hypnotic. The way they drift and nudge each other, the way light plays off wet bark, the faint scent of tannins in the air. This soaking does something vital. Fresh cut timber wants to dry quick and split. It wants to warp and crack. Submerging logs stabilizes the fibers keeps the sap from hardening too fast, and makes the wood behave when it finally meets the saw. In a place that prides itself on producing oversized beams and precision cuts, that controlled soak is the difference between usable timber and ruined material. And then there are the pond workers, known around mills as pond monkeys. Don't let the nickname fool you. This is skilled, sometimes dangerous work. They don't leap from log to log like the old stories anymore. Most use small motorized boats, but the instincts are the same. With a long pole hooked at the end, they steer, untangle, and sort floating giants, deciding which logs head to the head rig next and which need more time to settle. It's seamanship for wood, timing, balance, and a quiet intimacy with how logs move across water. As the sun dips and the mill's silhouette grows, you can almost hear the next phase clicking into place. The hoist, the debarker, the long bandsaw waiting to eat through history. That's where we're heading next. But first, take this in. This place marries raw muscle and careful craft, and every log here has a story waiting to be told. The surface of the pond ripples as one of the logs begins its next journey. A worker in a faded jacket steers a small motorboat toward it, pole in hand, guiding the floating giant toward a steel ramp that disappears into the mill. The air smells like wet bark and machine oil now, the forest perfume mixing with the scent of hot metal. The calm rhythm of the pond fades into the pulse of machinery, and the log's transformation begins. A heavy steel chain wraps around the trunk, 
clanking and straining as it hauls the log up from the water. The moment it breaks the surface, you can see decades of life etched into the bark. Rough ridges, scars, maybe even the faint trace of a lightning strike. To most, it's just a tree. To the mill workers, it's a biography written in wood. The first stop, the debarking shed. Once upon a time, men had to strip this armor by hand, hacking away with axes and knives for hours. It was brutal work, slow, dangerous, and exhausting. But here, inside this shed, the job belongs to a machine that looks like a mechanical beast. The log rolls in, and the air fills with the deep growl of spinning steel. Dozens of razor-sharp blades rotate at blinding speed, tearing off the bark in thick, curling strips. In seconds, the dark outer layer is gone, revealing pale, clean wood underneath. The raw core of the tree. The sound is deafening. Metal against wood, bark against steel, echoing through the shed like thunder trapped in a tunnel. When the machine finally spits the log out, what remains is a gleaming, stripped trunk. Smooth, cold, and ready for the saw. Nothing here is wasted. The bark and splinters swept from the floor are collected, ground down, and burned as fuel to power the very boilers that drive the mill. It's a perfect loop. Waste turned to motion, motion turned to purpose. Next comes cross-cutting. This is where precision begins. A massive saw, taller than a person, swings down to slice the trunk into manageable sections. Each cut is deliberate, based on how the wood will later be milled. You can almost see the Sawyer's calculations as they watch the grain and choose where to divide it. Too long and it won't fit on the carriage. Too short and valuable material is lost. Every inch matters. Each piece is loaded onto a conveyor belt that hums with life, inching forward toward the heart of the operation, the log carriage. Imagine a railroad cart armed with iron claws, ready to grip the wood and feed it straight into the enormous bandsaw head. The carriage rocks on its track, rolling back and forth in rhythm with the spinning blade. The entire system looks alive, a creature breathing steam and sawdust. Then there's the Sawyer. If the carriage is the heart, the Sawyer is the soul. These men and women don't just watch gauges or dials. They read the log the way a musician reads sheet music. Every knot, every twist in the grain tells them something about how the tree grew and where it will want to split. They don't just cut wood, they interpret it. One wrong move can waste hundreds of pounds of material, or worse, ruin the balance of the entire batch. But one perfect cut, one clean face, can yield flawless timber worth thousands. The Sawyer's hand grips the lever. The bandsaw shrieks to life, a blur of steel slicing into the log. Chips fly, a fine mist of sap fills the air, and the smell of fresh cut wood hits like nostalgia. Slowly, the log transforms into squared off blocks known as cants, the rough shapes from which beams and boards will be born. Each pass strips away another layer, exposing tighter, straighter grain. It's like watching a sculptor reveal what's hidden beneath the marble. From here, the cants roll down to the resaw line, where another set of blades takes over, slicing, trimming, and refining. Each pass narrows the lumber, brings it closer to its final form. But even as machines dominate the rhythm, human touch still rules the outcome. Skilled graders stand by, eyes trained to catch the slightest imperfection, a warp, a crack, a hidden knot, They'll see it before anyone else. That's the balance here. Power and precision, technology and instinct, always side by side. By the time the last board drops from the conveyor, the floor is covered in curls of sawdust, the air is warm with steam, and the scent of resin lingers like incense. The noise, the motion, the coordination, it all feels like a living organism, pulsing with the same steady energy it's had for nearly a century. And as the blades wind down and the carriage retracts for the next log, you realize every board that leaves this place carries a fragment of that story. But the journey isn't over yet. Next, we'll step into the hidden heart of the mill, the saw filing shop, where precision isn't about cutting wood, but perfecting the steel that makes it all possible. The saws fall silent for the first time all day. The thunder of steel and steam gives way to a low hum, a kind of peace that only settles once the last board has been cut. Workers wipe their faces, the air thick with the smell of hot sap and oil. But just when you think the mill has gone quiet, you hear it, a rhythmic, metallic ping, 
ping, ping, coming from a small building tucked away behind the main floor. That's the filing room, the hidden heart of Hull Oaks. Inside, it's a completely different world. The light is dim, the air still, and the floor glows faintly from the forge nearby. Rows of massive saw blades lean against the walls like silver moons, each one 50 feet long and barely thicker than a coin. These are the bands that chew through the logs day after day, and right now, they're being reborn. At the center of the room stands a saw filer, sleeves rolled up, hammer in hand, eyes sharp and steady. This job isn't just maintenance, it's a craft, one that takes years to master. Every blade that comes off the mill has endured hours of stress, friction, and heat. The smallest nick, a bent tooth, even a hairline crack could ruin a day's production. The filer's job is to restore perfect balance, to make the steel sing again. He begins by clamping the blade into a grinding machine. Sparks flare as the first tooth meets the stone. The smell of hot metal fills the air. Each tooth must be sharpened at the perfect angle deepen to just the right curve. The rhythm of grinding is almost meditative, steady, deliberate, like a heartbeat. A thousand tiny adjustments all by hand. Next comes tensioning, the part that separates apprentices from masters. When a blade spins at high speed, internal stresses make it want to warp or wobble. Pipes hiss softly. This is where the old soul of the mill still lives, a steam engine built in an era when horsepower meant literal power. Its pistons pump in steady rhythm, driving belts and gears across the entire floor. It's a masterpiece of engineering that refuses to die. While most of the world moved on to electric motors and automation, Hull Oaks chose to preserve its heartbeat. That decision wasn't just nostalgia. Steam has a character of its own. It's steady, reliable, and strong. You can feel it in the way the ground vibrates, in the faint whistle that escapes each valve. Every puff of vapor is history still breathing. Proof that the knowledge of an older America hasn't vanished. It's just been refined. Nearby, the crew prepares the next batch of massive timbers. Beams so large they'll become bridge decks or ship supports. These are the logs too big for modern mills to handle. A crane glides overhead on steel rails, hooks onto a fresh beam, and lifts it as if it weighs nothing. There's a kind of grace to it, mechanical but strangely poetic. Watching it move, you can't help but admire how seamlessly man and machine have learned to work together here. As twilight settles, the mill's rhythm slows again. Steam drifts across the yard, the smell of resin lingers, and the last boards of the day are stacked neatly on pallets. The workers exchange nods. No celebration, no grand speeches, just quiet pride. They know the legacy they're upholding, a tradition of craftsmanship, endurance, and respect for the material that built this country. But the story doesn't end here. Before these timbers begin their journey across America, there's one final act left. Stacking, grading, and sending each piece of wood out into the world. In the last chapter, we'll follow the lumber's final passage. From the yard of Hull Oaks to the hands of builders who still recognize the value of something made with patience, sweat, and steam. The yard outside the mill glows under the soft evening light streaks of orange cutting through the rising steam. The sound of the saws has faded, replaced by the low hum of forklifts and the crackle of wood settling into neat piles. This is the final chapter of the process, stacking and shipping, where the story of each log becomes the foundation for something far bigger. Freshly cut lumber slides down the conveyor, each board inspected and sorted by trained eyes. Graders stand along the line, flipping each plank, feeling the texture, studying the grain. It's not about perfection, it's about purpose. Some boards are destined for furniture, others for houses, others for bridges that will outlast the people who built them. Each is marked according to its grade, a tiny stamp that tells a story of its strength and resilience. Once graded, the lumber is stacked with near military precision. Forklifts move gracefully between aisles, hoisting massive bundles of timber onto drying racks. From above, the yard looks like a city built from golden blocks, row after row stretching toward the tree line. Steam rises in thin wisps, curling into the cool air as the boards begin to dry naturally. No chemical accelerants, no rush processes, just time, airflow, and patience. The way it's been done for generations. Inside the warehouse, an older worker, 
Gray hair, calm eyes, oversees the stacking process. He's been here for decades, seen the rise of automation and the slow fading of mills, just like this one. Every board has a bit of the forest still in it, he says quietly. You can smell it if you pay attention. He's right. That scent, a mix of resin, sawdust, and steam, is something you don't forget. It carries the memory of the tree it once was, the roar of the saw in the hands that shaped it. The next phase is shipping. Massive Kenworth trucks, the same kind that once battled steep logging roads, now line up at the loading dock. Forklifts swing into action, stacking the bundles onto trailers. Chains clink, ratchets tighten, and the final load is secured. When the driver climbs into the cab and the diesel engine roars to life, there's a sense of completion, a cycle fulfilled. From forest to mill, from raw power to refined product, the journey comes full circle. Each truck pulls away slowly, carrying its cargo across winding Oregon roads, past rivers and through towns where wooden beams hold up the very homes and bridges people drive over. That's the unseen beauty of places like Hull Oaks. Even if most people never visit, they live surrounded by its work. Every timber that leaves the yard isn't just wood. It's a signature, a continuation of a craft that refuses to vanish. As the last truck disappears down the road, the yard falls into quiet again. The workers head home, the steam cools and the sound of crickets takes over. But even in that silence, the mill doesn't truly rest. The boilers keep their slow rhythm through the night, the machines cooling with a soft hiss, as if exhaling after a long day's labor. When morning comes, the process will start all over again. Logs hauled from the forest, pond monkeys guiding them across the water, sawyers reading the grain like a story, filers tuning the blades with the precision of violinists. Each roll, each action, carries the same weight, preserving a link to the past while producing for the present. Hull Oaks isn't just a mill, it's a living time capsule. It embodies the ingenuity and resilience that built America's infrastructure long before automation took over. The people here aren't working relics, they're guardians of a tradition, proof that craftsmanship and innovation don't have to exist in separate worlds. They meet here every day in clouds of steam and sawdust. So the next time you walk into a building and run your hand along a timber beam, think about where it might have come from. There's a chance it began right here, deep in Oregon, in a place where history hums through pipes, steam drives pistons, and every cut is made with respect for the tree it once was. The Hull Oaks Lumber Company isn't just cutting wood, it's cutting through time itself, preserving the heartbeat of an industry that once shaped the world, and reminding us that progress doesn't always mean letting go of the past.